All right, so now we have um, some great resources for all of you, and I know what we're going to learn a lot from each of these individuals here who have volunteered to share their story. And um, this will be very informal, but I think we'll start at this end, and we'll allow each of you to just take a few minutes to, to share a bit about your history with kidney cancer and uh, from the beginning to where you are now, and then we'll allow them um, and use some time to ask each one some questions. I'm Dave Wanta. Um, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Actually, just outside of there, but Omaha is the big scene. Um, I have really, really taken, you know, I'm going to take a lot away from this. I, I've never been in any, an event like this uh, where, particularly where doctors could tell you something and you understood it. Uh, but uh, so I really appreciated that. But my story is um, I was um, I retired from the Air Force after being a, a pilot for 23 years. Pretty much thought I was bulletproof. Looking back, I actually failed my last two flight physicals and my retirement physical for um, blood and urine, or protein as I like to say. And each time they called me back, did the urine test again, passed, good to go. You know, nobody ever thought to look at it to see what, if that was an indicator of anything. So about a year and a half after I retired, I had my right kidney removed. Um, Nice little scar along the ribs. Um, and that lasted for about 16 years. 16 years, 15, 16 years. I don't see that young lady out there uh, asked about the mother. But um, then I um, foolishly in between there, I was a, I was a pretty good smoker. Um, in between there, having the kidney removed, um, and about, like say, about five years after that, I had... Uh, uh, metastasized. Uh, I was having gallbladder attacks, and I went in and did the ultrasound, and they said I had a bunch of stones in my gallbladder, and did the blood test, and the doc said, there's something wrong with your pancreas. And so I, I have the top of the pancreas. I've got about uh, a 0.6 centimeter size tumor. That was about uh, 1.4 centimeters. Um, I did IL-2. I swear by it. Thank you, Doc, for being one of the guys that does it. Um, the um, I had uh, I did the, the first week. I don't know if you're those of you who aren't familiar with it. You do a week's worth of treatment every eight hours. You're out for a week. You go back in. You do that again. Then you take a month off and you can go back and recycle. I just did one month's worth. Um, I did um, 13 treatments the first week. And I did 12 the second. Um, it reduced it down to um, about uh, 0.4. And um, a month later went in, which is what I liked about IL-2 and why I opted for the treatment was because I'd find out if it worked relatively or rather quickly. And um, got the size. It didn't go away. I was a partial responder. You know, and I was content because no growth was good growth. And uh, so then foolishly went on smoking. And um, last fall went in again uh, because it had grown in the last two years about uh, uh, 0.7 centimeters. So I went in last fall, did IL-2 again. Uh, I had those wonderful side effects. And uh, it's down to about 0.3 centimeters. And... Uh, I'm trying desperately to quit smoking. I'm making headway. I'm going to see a hypnotist here this next week. But uh, anyhow, that's my story. I've done two rounds of IL-2. Um, it beats you up, but uh, I, in my opinion, it's worth it. And uh, my philosophy is I'm going to die with this. I'm not going to die from it. Um, I think everybody has a fear who's had cancer, has fear of getting cancer again. You get an ache. You think, oh, is that it? You can let it dominate you, or you can wake up every morning and say, thank you, Lord, for another day. I'm going to go out and love my kids, go out and have some fun. And uh, otherwise, it'll just drive you nuts. So I'm going to pass it on.
Yeah, I wanted to make sure I heard you right. You said you had a lesion on the top of your pancreas? Yes. But how, how was your kidney doing at that same time? The kidney's fine. Oh, okay. I, that okay. was... I was yeah. trying to... My one and only kidney is, is, you know, of course, when you do IL-2, that's the concern is, you know, you, most people are fortunate to have two kidneys. And when you have one, uh, IL-2 is a little bit rough, and it can shut down the kidney temporarily. So what uh, were you staged at for your kidney? Kidney was stage two. Okay, stage two. On, on and, you know, I want, I want to, IL-2, you know, you're talking about young people. I was 60 when I did it the first time. Right. Okay, and uh, I'm not young. I'm not fit. Um, I did pass the stress test, pass the pulmonary test. When the oncologist told me he was going to do a brain scan, I told him, you know, you're not going to find anything. There's nothing there. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. I, I had my kid removed about the same age. I was stage three. I was, I was amazed at how many people have one kidney after I had that taken out and how many people are born with one kidney. I ran into somebody that had three. You know, I said, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, how long between first and second round? Uh, six years. One for six years ago, and then one for six years. Yes. And the oncologist, he said, this, you know, you're an anomaly. You're, you're an anomaly. Because I was on that, if you've seen the, the IL-2 slides, partial responders, you're down there at about 20%, and you're running forever. And... Um, I was doing fine. Like I said, I just, I don't think I was an anomaly. I think I was stupid. Um, but uh, like I say, a partial response for me is uh, no growth is good growth. You know, I'm content. It was confirmed. Um, biopsy. And they had uh, the, actually, the uh, pathologist at the military hospital registered my tumor, I guess. Is that the right word? And again, somehow or other, they, when they did the uh, biopsy of the, of the growth on my pancreas, within, you know, day and a half, they found the, the uh, chemistry uh, on my original kidney uh, tumor, and it was the same. Yes. Magic. <laughs> no, I don't. I you know I don't. I don't mean to be flippant. Uh, no, I. I wouldn't flip it. I think most people understand. Okay, so basically, the people with hearing aids aren't hearing what you're asking. Okay. My name is Kathleen Shelley, and I was diagnosed in the year 2004 with. Um, stage four, grade four renal clear cell carcinoma. Um, as it happened, I was right in between when the surge came for the targeted therapies. I was very fortunate. I had a full left nephrectomy, which is all pretty much what was done then. But also I had a very large tumor, it was 13 centimeters by seven. And it was um, good to have it out of there. Um, I was one of the people in Dr. Thompson's original SUTENT trial that was here at SCCA. I was assigned to the control arm, which was interferon al alpha, and I was on that for two years before it recurred. After that, SUTENT had just been approved, so I went on SUTENT. I was on SUTENT for the next eight years, all of this without NED, NED. It was a wonderful thing. Because it was stage four, grade four, a very aggressive um, cancer with sarcomatoid features, um, they wanted me to stay on it, and I did. I stayed way on it. But in the last couple of years, Dr. Thompson and my oncologist were encouraging me to maybe see what life would be like without it. And so a year ago, I went off all the drugs. It's been a fun year. I got some energy back and started doing wonderful things again. Um, life on SUTENT was certainly, um, I went through all the side effects and I had them, we controlled them, they're all controllable. Life is good, but it's better when you're not on it. And um, I have enjoyed this year. 
But I wanted to talk to whoever was talking about frequent scannings and all of that. And that is that I get monitored very closely because it was such an aggressive cancer. And so every six months, I have a PET scan. And the PET is pretty good at picking up metastasis. And so, in fact, that's how they found my metastasis in the first place. There was a PET scan that came to uh, Swedish in 2004. And that was where they first found out after this, three months after the surgery that I had metastasized. I do it without contrast because I only have one kidney, but it is still pretty effective. And so I do that as my routine every six month scan. Um, my philosophy in looking at this is that yes, maybe there is a problem in future years with more cancers caused by the radiation, but I was, I am 68 years old and when you consider that these are all long-term problems. If I find that I have cancer that was related to the radiation when I'm 88, I'll just be real happy to be 88. And I want to make sure that if it recurs, then we can step on it and not let it go to where it's um, running away with me. Um, my treatment at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance has been very important part of my life. It's nice to see John here. We've known him 10 years now. In September, it will be 11 years since my diagnosis. At the time, because there was so little available, it was pretty much a death sentence. They told my family, 18 months, two years, that kind of thing that people aren't supposed to ever say to patients, right? But they did, and here I am. If you're recent and new to this kind of thing, take hope. God blessed me with good response to Sutent. Not everybody has a good response to each or any of the drugs, but there are a lot of things available out there. And don't give up if the first one doesn't work for you. I have one for Kathy. Did you tell them about your trip to Connecticut? <laughs> well, because I was on Sutent for so long about Four years ago, I think it was, Pfizer took me out to Connecticut where they have their headquarters and said, would you address our researchers? And the reason um, I went out there was to thank them for developing SUTEN and to encourage them to keep on with research and development because there are those of us out here who are pretty much alive because of the work that they have done. Uh, were you advised when you started on Sutent that it was not necessarily designed to cure it, but to keep it under control? That's true, and I think that's still true. And that is, Sutent isn't a cure. It, Dr. Thompson frequently refers to it as the dam that holds it back. And he warned us that at any point, this sneaky stuff could sneak around the edges and burst the dam. Um, for me, that didn't happen. but. Because I've been off of it for a long period of time, that is, of course, back of your mind, this could be recurring, which is why I stay in frequent contact and intend to be scanned as often as I can. Um, you said that you have a PET scan as opposed to a CT scan. Correct. Um, and do you know, does that have less radiation than, than a CT or, or why? There's I'm sure it has more than a CT scan because most of them are overlaid by a CT scan. And I'm not sure of what the relative things, but I do know that it picks up cancer very, very early. And so for me, that's a plus. Kathy, during your time on Sutin, did you vary the dosage and the, and the frequency? Yes. Um, good question, because at first they always start you off, especially in the clinical trial, at 50 milligrams. And that's a pretty big punch. Um, the side effects were dramatic, but when, you want, when you're starting it, that's not a bad thing to give it a good punch. After about eight months, um, we backed it off to 37.2, and that's pretty much where I stayed for the rest of those years. Four on, two off. And I think you once told us how week one, two, three, how the progression went for you. 
Um, the first week isn't all that bad. Second week, you start to notice it. Third week, you're aware that you're on something. Fourth week, you're pretty much... Confined uh, to the bathroom, I think you told yep, us. Yep, and uh, the, la the first week of your time off, you're still recovering. So you have a really good week six of your cycle and a really good week one. <laughs> But the rest of the time, it's not like you lay in your bed. I did not go to bed and, you know, I, every day we were up and dressed and doing things. It's just that you take a nap or you do whatever it takes for you to cope with the things that happen. I had a lot of hand-foot syndrome, so that limited my walking and those kind of things. No longer walk an hour with the dog every morning, you know, those kind of things. Life changes, but life was good. Hi, um, I'm Greg Mickelson. Uh, I was diagnosed with, uh, in 2007, I was in my 30s, so I'm one of the rare cases of the younger uh, person I was diagnosed. I have the chromophobe histology, which is rare. Um, I guess if there's any upside to it being rare, it's been slow growing, uh, so definitely good news. Uh, after my radical nephrectomy, I enrolled in a trial here at uh, Seattle Cancer Alliance. It was uh, the, to determine if adjuvant therapy would prevent recurrence. And it was, I believe it was sutent uh, versus placebo. Um, it, ultimately, it was determined I was in the placebo arm. Uh, I was diagnosed with medic, metastatic disease in 2009. It was really part of the trial. Um, after the trial wrapped up, I was on kind of a three-month cycle. Um, being treated under the care of Dr. Ty Cody, and that's when we found that um, bone lesions had presented themselves in multiple areas. Um, so I've lived with those lesions ever since. Um, fortunately, um, I had a pretty long period of stable disease, um, almost four years. Uh, originally, Dr. Ty Cody had me on uh, temsirolimus, uh, the infusion therapy, but uh, I had some bad side effects um, specifically um, pneumonitis. So we transferred therapies and I was on sutin for a brief time, but then saw some disease progressions and some bone mets, which actually led to radiation therapy for a period of time. Just before my wife and I got married, I went through a, a cycle of radiation, so that was, that was interesting. Um, following that, Dr. Tycote had me um, on Affinitor, and I've been on on Affinitor ever since, despite some uh, changes. Um, I did have, uh, they detected a small fracture in my uh, left femoral head. Uh, I, w I reported in, it, this is one of the things, that, the great things about John Smith, and at the time, uh, Sharon Rockwell, was they were adamant about reporting in any slight change, any condition, just let them know, they'll decide what to do. So I reported that I was having some pain in my growing area. Um, Dr. Ty Cody said, you know, why don't we just take a, a quick uh, MRI of that? We did that, and they found a small fracture, and it was determined that that, given my disease, and I have bone metastasis, that was not going to heal uh, cleanly. So that's when I had um, partial hip replacement surgery. I actually had that done back at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I should note that um, my wife and I grew up in the Minneapolis area. Our extended family, brothers, sisters, um, cousins, aunts, uncles, they're all based in the Minneapolis area. So we tend to, uh, when the big things happen, we tend to head back to uh, the Mayo Clinic to get treated. Um, most recently, um, again, I had a long period of stable disease. Um, most recently, I um, was diagnosed with a brain metastasis in December, this past December, December 2014. So I had what was uh, called a uh, stealth guided craniotomy um, in December and actually came out of that really, really well. Um, had a, I have a little bit of a vision deficit, but no memory loss, everything went really well. Again, um, the neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic performed that. Um, so that was uh, a blessing that we survived that. Interestingly, um, three days after I had my craniotomy where they removed the tumor of my brain, I had gamma knife radiation. Um, the thinking or the, the data that Mayo Clinic has is that uh, that reduces the risk of the tumor coming back in that same area. 
um, substantially if you have gamma knife immediately rather than waiting until you're completely healed um, from your craniotomy. Um, again, uh, been stable for the most part. I guess Dr. Tycote called it out that um, I've had some slow growth ever since I've had my craniotomy, but it's been very, very incremental. So I've stayed on the Affinitor, haven't changed therapy. The thinking is, is that alternative therapies might ex actually accelerate the disease, that I'm probably best off staying on Affinitor. But now we're kind of in, all right, it's time to start planning for that next phase. Um, so Dr. Ted Cody flagged the Nivola nivolumab phase four study that I would be a great candidate for. So we've been actively trying to find out where that's gonna be. Um, and the default would be if we can have it here at Seattle Cancer Care, we would definitely participate. Um, and then we've also moved forward with the genetic testing, again, based on Dr. Tycote's recommendation. Since my tumor type is so rare, um, definitely get, we're going through the full panel. Um, Mayo Clinic is running that um, because things are emerging and changing so quickly in the immunotherapy and with all the, in the world of technology, all this big data that's out there, um, I think things are gonna keep moving faster. So better to have my tumors profiled now to be prepared for those changes. So um, I'm thankful for obviously the support of my wife. Um, I'm thankful for the tremendous care that Dr. Tycote and John and his team have, have provided. Uh, you don't realize what a great place SCCA is until you start going to other clinics. Um, I, I think I've spent more time in, in seeing Dr. Tycote more than I've seen my own family um, over the past seven years. So it's uh, been a relationship that has really grown and um, has meant a tremendous amount to uh, Jennifer and I. Um, so I've been blessed to be able to work full time. I've had a tremendous quality of life. And again, um, the intervention that uh, John and Dr. Tycote have mentioned um, have been so helpful. And then finally, the, the group that Art and Julie lead here has been invaluable just to be with people um, here on the panel that have had the same experience. Um, and many people have served as such an inspiration for me to keep pushing through. Um, even those that have um, gone before us, Al Marsh, Steve Cronkite, um, yeah, uh, Steve Brown, uh, you know, those definitely are inspirational people and um, so glad to be in this with together with all of you guys. Questions for Greg? Questions for Greg? You really covered the ballpark. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Can you hear me now? I'm Richard Catlett. And I'm going to tell you my story briefly. If you're interested in all the details of how I found I had kidney cancer and what I've done to relieve myself of it, it's been published in the SCCA website. Just go there, go to the search box, type in my name, Richard Catlett, and it's all there, and you can show it to your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> or put it, put it in the birdcage, one or the other. Um, I was 61 in April of 2007. I was a regular patron at the Squim uh, Aquatic and Recreation Center. We call it the Squim Gym. And I was working out every other day and had been for a number of years. I had retired to Squim from Northern California after a 35 year career in real estate and had joined the country club, was playing golf, was walking my dogs every night, a couple of miles, tending a two and a half acre garden, including an apple orchard and lots of fruit and berries, a flock of chickens, three cats and two dogs, and a wife. And life was pretty good for me. All my dreams had come true. I luckily earned enough money to be able to live the way I wanted to live, and it was pretty good. Uh, on the morning of the 16th, I went to the gym. I did a complete set of exercises, including bench pressing 200 pounds 30 times, 45 minutes on the Stairmaster at the highest setting. I was 
six foot seven and weighed 261 pounds, and I was in pretty good shape for a 67-year-old. The next morning, I got up, got on my computer, saw a beautiful picture of a steelhead trout my friend Mark Brown had caught in a river we used to fish together. Got up from the computer, went out to get my lawnmower to mow my two and a half acres, and fell down in a heap in the front yard with a broken left femur. It had literally disintegrated just above the knee. I had no idea what was going on, except I heard an awful lot, and I was frightened and confused. There was nobody home at the time, and the dogs didn't care. So I did the best thing I could. I started to yell as loud as I could, and my neighbor showed up a few minutes later. I said, what are you doing? You're supposed to be mowing your lawn. I said, I can't mow my lawn. I have a broken leg. Luckily, he called 911, and that started the procedure. I had an emergency procedure the next morning, putting a rod and pins in my left leg. And there was some suspicion that maybe I had something more than a broken leg, but nobody would. It was like the rhinoceros in the living room. No one, no one would acknowledge that there was something going on. And in fact, my GP came in the next morning on the 19th and said, you don't have cancer. They had tested the tissue that had come out of my leg, and there were no cancer cells in it. So I was happy about that, but I knew there was something wrong. And the leg wouldn't heal. And it went on and it went on and went on. Uh, X-rays every 10 days or so. Finally, the, the uh, orthopedic surgeon said, surgeon said, I'm going to go back in there and look again and see if I can find anything. He did an open biopsy and after an hour and a half found clear cell carcinoma. The next stop was uh, MRI CT scans and there was a 10.4 centimeter tumor in my left kidney. Been there all the time. So there I was lying in a hospital bed with a broken leg, stage four, grade four kidney cancer, and the world an oncologist within sight. The little town of Port Angeles does, didn't have an oncologist at that time. We had an internist who thought he was an oncologist, and that's who I ended up with. So the first advice I can give any new cancer patient, especially if you don't live in a major city where there are people of Dr. Tycote's quality around, is find yourself a real oncologist and get a second opinion on what's going on. So um, after I got my diagnosis, the internist had the good sense to give me Sutent. I took that for 18 months. Of course, as Kathy will confirm, that makes you very sick. So I had a broken leg. I was taking Sutent and I was sick. And I knew that I needed my kidney out, but I was too sick to go to Seattle. So finally, I found an orthopedic oncologist in Seattle who was willing to go in and rebuild the leg, take out all the old metal and put in his own new metal. Had my knee replaced. I have a synthetic knee now. A rod up to my hip and a rod down into my lower leg. And I can get around fairly well. I have a little trouble getting up and down, but pretty much live my life. I'm still mowing my yard, and I'm still tending my apple trees. And I still have my dogs and my chickens. But it's not the life I had before. It's a new life. But I'll take it. Um, a couple items that came to my mind when I was asked to come here today are some of the things I could give you folks that you might relate to and be able to use for yourself. How many of you have been told by friends or family or people you didn't even know that, gee, you gotta have a great attitude, you gotta laugh a lot. Good humor will save your life. How many, how many people have had that? You gotta have fun, you gotta laugh a lot. Good humor, that'll fix you right up. Well, there's a doctor named Carl Symington who has written several books, one called The Healing Journey. He addresses that 
area of unhealthy thinking, positive thinking, and, and the difference between the two. And he uses this example. Unhealthy thinking. I will be dead within two years regardless of what I do. And we all have those thoughts when we get our diagnosis. Positive thinking. Now this is the Pollyanna, this is the happy person all the time. I'll be alive and healthy in two years. I won't have any more problems. That's the person that won't take medication or, or thinks it won't help them. Healthy thinking takes both those principles. I may or may not be alive two years from now, and what I do, to, what I do between now and then will make a significant difference. What I do will make a significant difference. Well, what can you do? Educate yourself. The Internet is a wonderful resource for specific information about your disease. Learn as much as you can about what it is, what to expect. Seminars like this are available to us on occasion. You'll learn more today than you will in a month sitting watching the evening news. Um, we used to have a website called ACOR.net. It was a list net. And there were about 2,000 people that contributed to that on a regular basis. And I went there every day for about two years. And then we closed it down and started a new website called Smart Patients. Any of you can join Smart Patients. It's a group of kidney cancer survivors who talk to each other. You can ask any question you feel you want an answer to, and you'll generally get more than one answer. Um, it's a great resource, smartpatients.org. And you can log in and enroll and ask questions, and, and uh, it's a great resource. Uh, another thing that I did for myself that's been of great use to me is building a support system. Family, friends, church, support groups, community services, counseling, caregivers, building mailing lists and phone numbers. What I heard a lot finally sank in, when you have cancer, your whole family has cancer. And the people around you that you know and love and who know and love you are affected by it as much as you are. I know there are a number of caregivers here today. I recognize you from over the years at the meetings we've been to. It's important to pay attention to that and treat people around you in a proper way and engender their support. They'll help you a lot. Um, my friend Gene Anest saw I was having a little trouble getting up over there. He came over and grabbed me by the seat of the pants and lifted me up. That's the kind of support you need. <laughs> I'm getting to that. <laughs> Exercise. I'm an ex-athlete. I was a scholarship athlete at Arizona State University in two sports, track and field and basketball. I ran over 20,000 miles in my jogging career. Um, I was still walking two miles every day with my dogs when my leg broke, as well as going to the gym regularly. And I really think that my physical condition saved my life. Uh, I was fit enough to take advantage of the medications and protocols that the doctors recommended for me. And um, strong enough to endure through the suit and side effects and on into some of the other TKIs that I took. Uh, long story short, uh, I met Dr. Tycote early on, and he was of great help to me. And we got rid of that internist over there in Port Angeles. I understand he's still over there. I don't see him anymore. But set yourself up on an exercise program. Uh, buy a membership in a gym. Get an exercise cycle. Do something to keep yourself active every day. Uh, even with the walker, I get out and walk my dog every night. We don't go far, but we have a good time. And that's important. Um, weightlifting, cardiovascular work, 
And that leads me to diet, a low-fat, low-salt diet with emphasis on fruits and vegetables. And there are a number of good diets out there that you can buy copies of. I'm particularly fond of one that is sponsored by Dr. William Lee, who was involved in the original development of Sutent and other anti-angiogenic drugs. He got the idea that if you can make an anti-angiogenic drug, which is how Sutent affects tumors, why not look for anti-angiogenic foods? And so he now has a thing on the internet called the Anti-Angiogenic Society. And it's uh, a nonprofit you can join for free. And it has great ideas about food that you can eat that will help your body resist cancer. It may be a little bit of wishful thinking, but can't hurt. Um, so, and the third thing is a long word that I don't say very often. And I used to be kind of ashamed of saying it because it made me seem like kind of a kook but it's psychoneuroimmunotherapy. It's a big word. Look it up uh, on the internet. Psychoneuroimmunotherapy, what does that mean? It's commonly known as mind-body medicine. And it's applying your mind to your physical being. And um, there's a fellow down in Texas named Gerald White He's 82 years old. He's been surviving kidney cancer for over 20 years. Who's written a book and made a CD about how to apply your mind to your body to uh, fight cancer, kidney cancer expressly. And I talk to Joel on the phone pretty regularly. He just had a progression after 19 years in his lung, and he took Sutent, and it's gone again. So he's covering all his bases, but he still does his meditation. Um, you can learn to meditate uh, by b buying a book called The Relaxation Response by a Harvard doctor named Kurt Benson, The Relaxation Response. And it's about how to let your mind get control of your body. Uh, sounds a little far-fetched, but I did it for three years. Every night as I went to sleep. And it may not have done anything for me, but I sure slept better. Um, Dick, were you going to say a word about your immunotherapy trial that you're on? Yeah, I got real bad about a year and a half ago. Um, I was being checked on a regular basis, and my local oncologist out in Squim, Washington, found eight small tumors in my lungs. I had already met Dr. Ty Cody and had seen him, and uh, I thought, well, maybe it's time to see him again. And I looked up the website for the SCCA, and I saw that he was heading, heading a, uh, a trial, and it just so happened I knew what that drug, nivolumab, was because it used to be MDX-1106. And poking around on the computer, I had come across the National Institute of Health publication on MDX-1106 and read that they had some real dramatic responses from the few people that they gave it to. And in fact, it had some, I don't like to call them cures, I'll call them complete responses. In fact, Dr. Taikoti will let me say cure. He makes me say complete response. And he's right. But luckily, because I had gone back to Sutent and it had failed for me the second time, and I'd also taken a Votrient, and I had failed for me, uh, I was eligible to get this trial, and I did. And I started taking Novolumab October 16th, 
two, two Octobers ago. And the first set of scans I had were at six weeks. And I went into his office and he handed me a piece of paper. And I looked down at the summary and the first two words were dramatic reduction. That's when I started to cry. You don't see those words in those reports, dramatic reduction. We celebrated. It was a happy time for both of us. And especially for me. <laughs> but I've continued on the Novelabab since. I've had a couple of hiccups uh, with some atrial fibrillation, which may or may not come from the drug. But bottom line, I've had no real side effects to speak of. And my last report showed that I had from over 30 tumors in my lungs, a 10.4 tumor, centimeter tumor on my liver, and a 4.2 centimeter lesion on my third lumbar vertebrae in my bone again, that everything is gone except 2.3 centimeters of the liver tumor. Everything else is gone. I'm 87% tumor clear right now. So that's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. So it's really worked for me. And I, I see in nivolumab something of the future. It may be what we'll all eventually get for our primary care when it's, when it's approved and available to everybody. So if you get the vote on it, vote yes. <laughs> Question? For any of the panelists, I see a hand back there. I see. Take the close one first. Yeah, I, I just have a quick uh, question for Dick. Did you feel any pain or discomfort in your left uh, leg before it broke when you were mowing the, the grass? Was there any warning sign, any battle fatigue, or anything? Uh, part part of my work out at the gym was about a half an hour of shooting baskets. I'm an old basketball player. I still am, thank goodness. I don't do it anymore, but I still think about it. I've been shooting some baskets and jumping and running around, and I felt a little twinge in my left leg. And I thought, well, it's just an old knee injury, and I'll run it off and forget about it. Well, it wasn't an old knee injury. It was the bone beginning to disintegrate. And it progressed from that was about three weeks before. It wasn't dramatic. It wasn't excruciating. It was just that my, my leg hurt a little bit. And as I say, I walked my dogs every night. And I'd walk vigorously for two miles. And never any problems there. And working in the yard, riding my mower, pruning my fruit trees. Uh, all in all, no symptoms. Just bulbos in a pile on the ground. I literally felt felt it break, and I I thought that I had dislocated my knee. I don't know why that came to my mind, but that's a thought I had. But no, it was pointed off in the other direction. Uh, you mentioned the ACOR list, and I used to be a member of the ACOR papillary list. The new thing that you mentioned, smart patients, does that have a separate one for papillary also? Yes, it does. Uh, various types of kidney cancer, any type of cancer has a, has a category, many categories. Oh. And so you can specialize or go on a general list. And I, and I wanted to just say a couple things from my own thing. Um, I've got papillary. I'm nine years out now, and I have spots that they're following on my lungs and liver and stuff. But I really wanted to emphasize what you said about getting that second opinion and getting to a major center. Um, and I had two major centers that disagreed, so I got a third opinion. And the third one said if I had followed the recommendation of the first doctor I'd gone to, I would have been dead within a year. It's you know, getting that second opinion is so, so, so important. And that first place I went to, they said that they offered a cancer survivor network and you could sign up, so I did. And then they said, oh, we don't have any kidney cancer survivors. 
So, yeah, get the second opinion. Take your MRI and shop it everywhere. Mine went to Seattle, Mayo, Duke, MD Anderson, Stanford. It went everywhere because mine was complicated, and all my friends and relatives said, send it here. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you so much to Art and Julie. Pardon? I'm from Washington. I live in Linden. And I, I'm a member of Art and Julie's group, and I just cannot say enough about it because I was all by myself, had no clue. I posted something on the kidney cancer website and said, I'm so alone, I don't know what to do. And Mr. Dahlia Man contacted me, <laughs> and it's just been such a godsend. Anybody else have questions for the panel? Questions for the panel? Okay, way over there. How much do you bench press today? <laughs> How much does he bench press today? 150, 30 times. But I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit. Um, another, if you've got a pen and pencil, this is a great uh, resource for kidney cancer patients. It's Steve Dunn, D-U-N-N, Cancer Guide. And Steve Dunn was a kidney cancer patient 20 years ago. And he's one of the first to really start a blog and a kidney and cancer site. And he collected a lot of really good information that's a good jumping off point for today. And one of the things in there that I picked out that has been with me continuously from the first time I looked at this site, um, do you remember um, that television program, the billions and billions of stars? Uh, what was his name? Carl Sagan? He had a partner named Jay Gould, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a scientist who had his own television program. And he contracted cancer. And he wrote an article for Steve Dunn called The Message is Not the Massage. This is back in Marshall McLuhan's time. But his thought was that we see those graphs, and we see the median, and nine out of ten of us will look at the median and say, that's how long I got to live, because the median is usually in like 50 days or 90 days or whatever. Well, my doctor told me I had 90 days to live. No, he didn't. He told you that the median for people with your symptoms was approximately 90 days, according to the data that's been collected. Look at the rest of the curve, and look at that tail that runs way out there. In some instances, it hasn't run all the way out because not everybody's died yet. But in any cohort of patients, there'll be a median and then there'll be a long tail going way out to the end. And Jay Gould talked about that from a scientific point of view. And he lived for 19 years of, with mesothelioma. Mesothelioma. Thank you. <laughs> Which is usually fatal quite soon. Well, I'm eight years now with kidney cancer. And yes, we do have a support group now. Um, and there are survivors. And let's keep it that way. Okay, when Julie and I started on this road when she was diagnosed, there was really not much hope and uh, really not much going for us. And somehow um, the Kidney Cancer Association happened to be coming out to Seattle periodically and they would host these meetings at a room at a hotel down near the airport, which is where we got together with some other kidney cancer patients and started to find some of the first signs of hope. And since then, we went back to Washington, D.C., and we've subsequently been to Houston and San Francisco and uh, Chicago multiple times with the Kidney Cancer Association. And we have the Kidney Cancer Association here today in the person of Carrie. Carrie, would you like to say some words as to what the group is all about and why we owe so much to you? We owe a lot to you, too, so thank you. <laughs> um, as Art said, I'm with the Kidney Cancer Association. We are celebrating our 25th anniversary year, and as many of you who are these long-term survivors, it's amazing for me to hear your stories. I know when I got started, um, you know, 
a lot of these therapies were not approved yet. Um, patients were coming here just trying to find what they should be doing next. And it is amazing for me to see how far this disease um, has come. Uh, we were founded um, by a kidney cancer patient, um, Dr. Eugene Schoenfeld, who was from the Chicago area. He was a PhD at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. And when he received his diagnosis, there were no treatments, there were no support groups, nothing that he could do. And um, as an academic, he thought, you know, this isn't satisfactory to me. I need to do something about this. And so his physician challenged him, and he, with a couple of doctors and some patients, sat around his kitchen table and formed the Kidney Cancer Association. Um, Gene was very um, active in the fast-track approval for kidney cancer drugs, um, helping to get IL-2, um, one of the first therapies that we had for kidney cancer patients. Um, by continuing to grow the organization, um, you know, doing small meetings um, to larger meetings like this, um, I think we've been able to really build a network of patients, and sometimes the best things um, that we hear from patients is just getting an opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one time with different doctors, to talk to other patients, um, and to really keep yourself educated. You know, we've talk to people who um, have been long-term survivors but want to know that, you know, unfortunately if a therapy stops working, um, what, what the next option might be. And so I think it's important to keep educating yourselves, to attend meetings like this when you can. Um, you know, we're grateful for all of you to be here and the support that you give to our association. Um, in addition to these, these types of support group meetings, uh, we do have a couple of online communities. Our Facebook group, uh, Kidney Cancer, if you go to Kidney Cancer Association on Facebook, we have over 85,000 members from across the world. Um, so people are on there all the time talking about, you know, what kind of therapies they're on, asking questions about clinical trials, and really just going there for support to know that they're not the only ones fighting this disease. Um, we also have a community on um, Inspire, so it's a, a separate network. Um, inspire.com and if you go there and search kidney cancer we also have a very active group um, where there's different segments so you can look for you know different subtypes um, if you're interested in nutrition if you're interested um, in surgery and clinical trials and um, we have a moderator on that site as well um, we have a YouTube channel so if you go to YouTube and search kidney cancer association we'll have videos from um, meetings such as this one we do one at MD Anderson at Cedar sinai um, you know, each year we will kind of change that up a little bit. So you'll have an opportunity to kind of see similar talks, but from different doctors' perspective. Um, sometimes we'll have different patient panels. And then we also do two medical symposia each year. We do one in the U.S. every fall and then in Europe every spring. And while those meetings are targeted just for physicians um, and, and limited to the patients that attend, we do put those videos and all the slides online and encourage you to, you know, to watch those talk as, talks as well. But sometimes they go into a little more depth um, about some of the treatments and trials that are, that are going on. And we encourage you, you know, to visit our website to see some of the print resources that we might have available. Um, we have a video... Um, program that our nurse advisory board members did, and thank you to John, who's a member of that group, who talk about some of the different um, side effects uh, with these therapies and how to better manage those and learn how to live with some of the, these therapies that are helping patients to live longer. And at any time, if there's anything that we can do, if there's a resource that we don't have or questions that you might have for us, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, the easiest way is just to go to kidneycancer.org or to email office at kidneycancer.org. So again, I want to thank um, Art and Julie for helping to organize this, for Prometheus and Pfizer for supporting it, and for Dr. Tycote for um, getting things organized as well. So thank you all. I'm pretty shy about this, but um, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming today. I was, I, I'm just overwhelmed by your attendance and grateful. I'm just so grateful for you to be here and to hear all the speakers, all the survivors. Cause